listening to I Am Refocused Radio with your host, Shamaya Reed. This show is designed to inspire you to live your purpose and regain your focus. And now, here's your host, Shamaya Reed. Hey, welcome to I Am Refocused Radio. We are here once again today. Just like any other day, we have another amazing guest for y'all today. We have our special guest today, Hisha Abram. She is a professional peacemaker, internationally acclaimed master attorney, mediator, and negotiator, and author. She has an amazing book that we'll be discussing today. You can get it right now on Amazon or wherever you can get books. It's Holding the Calm, The Secret to Resolving Conflict and Diffusing Tension. So once again, I just want to welcome you, Hisha, to the show. How are you doing today? My pleasure. My pleasure. Look forward to talking to your audience. Yes, ma'am. And people can go visit holdingthecom.com. And first and foremost, give us a little background of your uh, professional career. Oh, that's kind of hard to do. I've been doing this a long, long, long time. And um, I, you know, I think in a past life, I must have been a warrior that now I had to be a peacemaker in this lifetime because I am not a kumbaya person. I'm a hot personality. I'm fiery. Um, I had to learn a lot to be able to stay calm and peaceful and hear both sides of a story and stand in the middle of warring people. Um, I've done, you know, the the ownership of the secret recipe for Pepsi. I've mediated and done work for Google and IBM and Facebook and Yahoo and Verizon and Apple and all the major players. And then thousands of individuals and companies and inventors all along the way. And I've learned a couple of things along the way. And that's why everyone was always bugging me because I would give a lot of speeches and they'd say, you got to write a book. You got to write a book. Who had time to write a book? I was working. I was busy. And um, I finally sat down a couple of years ago and said, all right, people need this. Our society is fraying at the corners because we don't know how to talk to each other. We try one thing and then it didn't work. So you're a jerk or an idiot or a narcissist or impossible or crazy. And then it all blows up and it doesn't need to be. So I want to share with people how to do this stuff and make your life a little easier. Resolving conflict is something that is not as easy to do if you're a newbie. So for the audience who are listening in, What are some of the things that are valuable skill sets for those who are new to resolving conflict? You got it. So notice the title of my book, Holding the Calm, The Secret to Resolving Conflict and Diffusing Tension. Kind of a long title. I didn't want to make it so long, but I had to because 100% of conflict starts with tension. 100% of it. And the tension can be, or it can be, "Mm -hmm, mm -hmm," which is actually a little harder when someone just withdraws. So how do you do it? And one of the analogies I like to use is spaghetti sauce. We've all dropped it on on the counter. You take a wet sponge, you wipe it up. It's no big deal. You leave it overnight. You're scraping it off with a knife. You leave it three or four months or three or four years, and it's old and moldy and gross. So the question is, that's conflict, my friends. And we all know, wipe it up when it's wet. But we don't do it. Why? Well, we're scared. We don't know how. We're afraid of making it worse. We're afraid of having some blowback on us. So we literally sit back and don't do anything, and it gets old and moldy. So these are some tricks about how do you do this so that you're not afraid, so that you know how to wipe that spaghetti sauce up while it's wet, so that you know how to talk to somebody, calm down a really angry person, calm down a crazy person, get to the heart of something, keep your power when someone's trying to take your power from you, equalize the playing field. I mean, professionals, this is what we do. And quite frankly, this should be taught in schools. And it's now just starting to be, but this should be taught in schools. Our our lives would be so much. Think about everybody listening. How much of your life is spent dealing with junk, cleaning up messes, avoiding people you hate, not getting your own way, you know, dealing with difficulty. How do you ask for a raise? You're afraid you're going to do it. 
Someone's afraid they're going to get fired. How do you break up with someone? How do you uh, deal with a crappy neighbor or a coworker or a boss? Much less have a political conversation where people think differently. I teach all that stuff in a simple little $15 paper bag book that you can read in two hours. <laughs> That's why I wrote this sucker. You speak in the book, how to be the grown up in the room, explain to the audience how they can do that and why that is a very important skill. Well, first of all, I have to compliment you because I've been on a lot of podcasts with people that have even, they haven't even really read the book. They just kind of skim it and want me to spoon feed it to them. And you clearly read the book. So kudos to you, my friend. And that's one of my favorite chapters because what's happening now is People are emotionally immature. And then when our buttons get poked, we don't react well. And there has to be somebody who's a grown up in the room. And you don't have to always make it be you. I'm a professional and I can get hot and bothered. My buttons can get pushed. I can be hungry, angry, cranky, tired, just like everybody else. But if you learn how to do this, and then you teach the people around you, and guess what? When you need it, they can do it too. And it's, how do you do it? And would your listeners like one quick, easy little tip that we can do right now? Yeah, definitely. So when I get hot, the first thing I say to myself is, I'm holding the calm, I'm holding the calm, I'm holding the calm. That takes two seconds. Now, the question, and this is a little bit of neuroscience, why does it work? Because you know the worst thing that you can do? Calm down. Take a deep breath. What's wrong with you? Calm down. That is the worst thing that you can do. So the question is why? Human beings have something called an amygdala. It's two tiny little kidney-shaped organs at the base of your skull, right above the brainstem. It's the fight, flight, or freeze response. And it happens in a nanosecond which is a billionth of a second. So I see something, is that a stick? Is it a snake? Is it food? My brain decides that in a nanosecond, which again, remember is a billionth of a second. That's how quick it is. We also look at human beings as friend or foe, like that. And it comes through our filters. And we have all kinds of neuroscience biases that our filters have, where we decide if somebody is friend or foe, but our body does that immediately. So when you get hot, your amygdala gets triggered. And what's the number one thing is the amygdala feels powerless. So it makes you try to grab power any way you can by being aggressive, by running away, by yelling, by crying, by bullying, by threatening, by bribing, whatever is something that you were raised with. That's what your body just does. So the number one antidote to that poison is to give yourself some power, but in a healthy, good way. So simply by saying, I'm holding the calm, I'm holding the calm, I'm holding the calm. What you are saying to your amygdala is, hey, girlfriend, boyfriend, I'm not powerless here. I've got choices. I've got options. What am I going to do? All of a sudden, the amygdala calms the heck down. Now you can think more clearly. Your brain works better. There's something called ocular occlusion and auditory exclusion, which basically is just fancy neuroscience for your eyes shut down and your ears shut down. You don't think. You're not clear. You don't see things when your amygdala is triggered. So the first thing to do is you're drowning. You need a breath of, of fresh air, but you can't do it because someone tells you to, because that makes you feel powerless. And that just activates the amygdala more. So that's why I titled the book this, because it's such a simple little mantra. It's like, it's like having magic beans in your pocket because it absolutely works. Then your next second is, what do I choose to do? And in the book, I've got sentence stems, I've got stories, I've got ideas, I've got things that you can say, all right, this is what I'm going to do. And there's so many that, you know, we we can go over for some of them with some of your listeners. 
in case people would like it. Once again, listen, I refocus radio talking to our special guest, Hesha Abrams. You can go check out the website, holdingthecom.com, or you can also go to Amazon and get her book there. When it comes to more things you do in your book, a lot of people can sometimes lack empathy. And Mm -hmm. when that happens, we kind of become bad listeners. You also kind of explore the idea of um, what we should be uh, listening to that are uh, not being said by the other party. So kind of touch on that for the audience. You got it. And I love that you read the book. Thank you for doing that. So let me give everybody a trick. Uh, yes, sometimes we lack empathy. And a lot of people are emotionally immature. And people don't have a good skill set when it comes to this interpersonal stuff. And your amygdala gets triggered. Well, that's a really bad cocktail. I mean, that it's no wonder no one listens to each other and they're just arguing with each other. So if somebody's talking, here's trick number one, use plural pl- pronouns. Instead of saying, that's ridiculous. What do you want? This is what I want. You start using plural pronouns. How are we going to solve this? How are we going to handle it? This is our problem. This is our discussion. It calms everything down and the person switches from seeing you as friend or foe to friend. Even if they get mad, what do you mean our problem? It's your problem. No, I think it's our problem. And I'm willing to work on it with you and try to get something resolved. No, it's not. It's your problem. Well, you can think about it that way if you want. But you know what I admire about you? Guess what? They stop talking. Everybody wants to hear what comes after that sentence. And you don't have to use the verb admire because you want to be truthful and authentic. You can say, you know what I admire about you? You know what I respect about you? Do you know what I like about you? Do you know what I love about you? Do you know what I'm intrigued about you? Do you know what I'm curious about you? See all those verbs? You pick anyone you want, whichever one fits for you. And then, you know what your answer is on the back end? Your determination, your passion, your enthusiasm, your curiosity, your desire to get to the truth, your wanting to get to the bottom of things, your desire for peace, your uh, your um, passion, whatever works in the situation. And I tell you what happens, the other person is shocked. They don't know what to say. They don't know how to react. They're just stunned. What just happened here? Because what you just did was you gave power to their amygdala. So they calmed the heck down. Now you're not friend or foe. Now they can talk to you a little bit. And you were still honest and authentic. You weren't fake sucking up and patronizing and lying. You know, you were being honest about what you did. And you know, that sentence works great at a, at a colleague's meeting. It works great at the Thanksgiving dinner table. It works great with neighbors screaming over whose dog is peeing and whose yard. And I've got these sentence stems in the book for people to just take them, use them. It is magic how it just calms everything the heck down because you're not talking to their brain. You're talking to their amygdala. Now, once that gets calmed down and the power is distributed a little bit, okay, now we can maybe engage in problem solving and discussing of options and what some of our choices are. It's, it's amazing stuff. And I tell you, it'll make you feel powerful as hell when you can do this. And people won't say, oh my God, you're amazing. You know how to hold the calm. No, what they're going to say is, you just get things done or you just glide through life and don't have any problems or you just seem to know how to get along with people or you can just make things happen. That's what people will say to you. In the book, you give us techniques to take difficult people or difficult problems. And like you said, just moments ago, finding a solution and finding a solution 
requires you to hold the calm and in some cases requires you to humble yourself. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, I like to do the advanced course here because if you're emotionally mature, you can humble yourself. And that is a great technique that actually gives you more power. Like the one who does that actually has more power in the interchange. However, I want to always do the realistic stuff here because in real life, a lot of times people are emotionally immature or tired or angry or cranky or in pain. And they don't do the emotionally mature thing. They don't humble themselves. They yell back. They punch back. They run away. They manipulate. That's just part of the human condition. I don't argue about it. I just accept it. And I look at it as a bomb. How can I diffuse that bomb? And the bomb detector, you know, waddles out into the town square where there's a bond and that a bomb and that, you know, big old tiry Michelin suit looking thing. He doesn't just start cutting wires. He looks, he diagnoses. Is it a chemical switch? Is it a pressure switch? Is it remote control? He looks. Then he starts disarming the bomb. It's the same thing for us. When you say I'm holding the calm, you're creating a moat around what you feel and what you choose to do. And the better at it you get, the bigger and deeper that moat is. Now I have choices about what I'm going to do. When you do that, who's got the power in the interaction? Who has the ability to make things happen? So it may be that you admit you were wrong, which is a little bit of humbling, but it may just be that you look at somebody and say, I had no idea you felt that way. Tell me more. The sentence, tell me more, is a magic wand. It's People don't expect that. They expect you to argue and fight and tell them why they're wrong or they're stupid or they're misguided. But when you just say, I want to understand, tell me more. You knock the wind out of their sails big time and you're going to learn. You're going to hear something because most people are not insane. They don't take a position because they're insane or they're stupid. They take a position because based on the knowledge and information they have and the skill set they have, that's the position they're taking. Okay, I want to understand that. Maybe I can help defuse that bomb. That's why this stuff is just, God, I wish it were taught in schools. You know, I'm thinking about writing an addition for middle school kids, because can you imagine how many kids get in trouble in school for fighting and then go to juvie and have criminal records and have so much difficulty just because they didn't know how to handle something. And whatever they were handled was not, middle school is awful. High school is awful. People behave terribly. And we don't teach people how to handle it. Then they grow up in real life and they continue to behave that way. So this stuff, my friends, is it's reading glasses. It's forks and knives when we're cavemen and women shoving food in our mouths. This is the next level of how you evolve as a human being. When managing conflicts, our listeners can use your techniques that they can practice daily, but not just that, uh, it also empowers them to kind of read the room wherever they are. Because mm. if you can't manage your own conflict, I don't think you can manage any other conflict outside of you. Good for you. That's a good insight. I'll share with you something I did when, because I've been doing this three decades. And when I was learning... I did uh, suicide crisis volunteer work. Uh, I did hospice work, helping people die. And that's, and I have a whole chapter in the book on that about how I learned to listen, like really listen and make somebody feel that you're listening. That's the important part about it. And so one day I was in Target and had to return something and there was a long line. And I just sat there watching and listening to all the people trying to return stuff. You see people lying through their teeth. You see people getting angry and aggressive. You see people manipulating. And so I sat there for about an hour and I watched and I learned and I thought, okay, what do they really mean? What are they really saying? 
What do they really need? How would I have handled that? How would I have transformed that? How would I have changed that? It was a tremendous learning lesson for me. And anybody wants to really get good at this stuff, I tell you, go volunteer for suicide crisis phone work. You're just sitting on a phone with someone on the other end. You can volunteer for hospice because when people are dying, the rubber meets the road and people, families don't handle dying very well. So you get a chance to deal with that. Go to Target or Walmart and just sit by the return desk and watch. You will be shocked at what you will learn. And then you will take that into your real life. You don't need some master's degree or master's class in something. You just need to practice this stuff that I put in the book and you'll get good at this. With your experience with many high profile uh, clients and being able to help them navigate, I guess you can say a storm. And Mm -hmm. one thing that happens after a storm is calm. Mm-hmm. What are some of the things that you've seen that maybe be a pattern of striking friction between individuals or departments, if you will? Uh, see, that's a very good question. You're trying to do preventative medicine. You know, so good for you. What you're trying to do is to see the problems earlier and earlier and earlier. So what you really are, sir, is a wiper up of the wet spaghetti. <laughs> That's, that'll be your new <laughs> title on your social media, the wiper up of wet, of wet spaghetti sauce. Um, but that's good. So, and it's an interesting question because chapter one of my book is speak into the ears that are hearing you. You have to stop and look at who you're talking to. Would you speak to an introvert the same way you would speak to an extrovert? Everybody is sort of saying, wow, I never thought of it that way. No, I wouldn't. How about somebody that's a big picture gut person versus somebody that's really detailed and likes to count to the penny? You wouldn't talk to them the same way. You talk to them different. How about somebody that everything is feelings versus somebody that everything is thinking and data and facts? You would talk to them differently, wouldn't you? See how simple that was? But what it requires me to do as the bomb detector is look at you. Who are you? What's important to you? And what's so interesting is all this diversity, equity, inclusion stuff that God knows our society needs. But it's honestly irrelevant. What difference does it make what you are on the outside? I'm looking at who you are on the inside. If we're actually talking to each other, we're engaging with each other. Well, all white men are not the same. All Hispanic women are not the same. All Asian men are not the same. I mean, it's it's ridiculous. And yet we look at it from the top level. I want to look at us individually. What's important to you? And then you, what happens is you feel that from me. I take a minute to literally be paying attention to you, what you're thinking, what you're feeling, what you need, what you want. That takes away half the poison right there, right there. And so it depends on where you get this conflict. If you waited until it was already raging, you could still do it. Just takes a whole lot more work. If you catch it while it's earlier, you can nip it in the bud. And if you start practicing this holding the calm stuff, you will get better and better and better at catching it earlier because it works absolutely when it is a big explosion. There's no question about it. Think of think of any fight you've ever had with anybody. If you waited until it was big and ugly, there's a lot you can do it, but it's a lot more work. If you caught it early with, I didn't mean to say that or that came out wrong. And I'll tell your listeners, you know, the best trick you can ever do, it's called a do-over. Let's say something comes out of your mouth, angry, stupid, ill-advised, you're tired, you didn't think it through, you didn't realize. We are all human. Every one of us does that. We give ourselves some grace. You can just look at the person and the wet spaghetti wiping up is to say, you know, that didn't come out the way I wanted to. Can I have a do-over? Who says no to that? Seriously, 
Who says no to that? So you say it better the next time. The other person now feels heard, valued, and listened, even though they might be bristling a little bit. That's okay. But you now can deal with it. I used to teach my kids that, um, that they use it all the time now. You just screw up. You say, can I have a do-over? Can I do that right? It's fantastic in relationships between partners, kids. It's fantastic because we all screw up. We're human for God's sakes. You know, you're hurting, you're in pain, you're tired, you're angry. You didn't get your own way. Traffic was bad, whatever. You just say, oh, geez, can I have a do-over, please? I love you. I care about you. I respect you. I didn't handle that the, really the way I wanted to. Can I have a do-over? People will love you if you do that. Holding the calm reminds me of, uh, I can't remember the person who said it, but they said uh, the same grace we want for ourselves, we must extend to others. Mm-hmm. And I feel like, too, holding the calm is like a metaphor of seeing the fall clear. Because when it's foggy, you're just going where you're going, but you don't know. (laughs) You're right. And the thing is, we're human. We screw up. We make mistakes. We get arrogant and self-righteous. And then the universe has a way of punching us in the gut. And then you go, oh, man. And this is the proof I say to everyone listening, no matter how old you are. Like, can I just ask you how old you are? 34. Okay. Are you smarter than when you were 24? Definitely. You will be smarter at 44 yeah. because you're doing this kind of work. The people that are listening to this podcast are, we're preaching to the choir. These are people that are committed to their own growth and committed to their own learning. And for every one of you listening, I'd like you to say to yourself, I am this old. Was I smarter? Am I smarter than I was 10 years ago? Ask yourself the question. Because every one of you is going to say yes. Then the question is, will I be smarter 10 years from now? I'm going to be 65 in a couple of weeks. I figure by the time I'm 70, maybe I'll know something. And I live my life that way. Every day, continuous improvement. What can I learn? What can I learn from you? What can I learn from somebody else? And unfortunately, I learn more from my mistakes and my successes And mistakes are painful. We don't like them. But you're an idiot if you don't learn from them. So if you learn from them, great. And then people will give you grace. If you say that to them, you give them grace, then you get grace. It's it's kind of a beautiful system. Yeah, failure is like the steps we take to get to the top of the staircase. And uh, Mm -hmm. if we don't use it, then like you said... (laughs) We're going to stay at the bottom of the staircase because mm-hmm. I think holding mm-hmm. the calm is uh, is as necessary as breathing air. You try mm-hmm. to hold your breath and see how long you can last doing that. Good for you. That's exactly correct. You know, and the thing is, why don't we teach this? For God's sakes, you know, a thousand people can build a building and it's one broken, angry person with a stick of dynamite can take it down. But if all of us can help, we can actually try to make our world a little bit better. You know, I mean, I can't, I can't control everything in this world. I can control me and my little sphere of influence. And I can try to make my little sphere of influence as healthy as I can. And then that's what you're doing. And then people listening to us, that's what they're doing. And we can affect other people by being the grownups in the room by committing to holding the calm, and we influence others. You absolutely influence others when you do that. And don't worry about the bad guys. Don't worry about the crazies. They're only about 15, 20% anyway. That means 80% of people are normal, good, kind, want a healthy, good life. We got 10 to 20% narcissistic, crazy people that want to take over and overpower. Okay, but if the 80% of us rise up and say, no, no, we're not going to allow that, we can take back our country, we can take back our families, we can take back ourselves and not get influenced by all these people. We can do that. We can. 
Once again, listen to Ivory Focus Radio talking to our guest today, Hesha Abrams. You can go to her website, holdingthecalm.com, or you can go get the book right now, Holding the Calm on Amazon, The Secret to Resolving Conflict and Diffusing Tension. Once again, I want to say thank you for your time. Uh, it's my pleasure. Also, connect with me on LinkedIn. I post all kinds of cool stuff all the time. Mm-hmm.